As you can see, the title of today is Unless I See. And as we begin, I invite you to join me in prayer. Most kind, wonderful Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you for your absolute love, your absolute presence in our lives, for always being right here with us. God, I thank you. I ask that you would take the message today and that you would pour into each one exactly what you want them to hear and to respond to. It's not just hearing, but a response. And God, I, I trust you through the Holy Spirit to do that. And God, just take the words and use them. In Christ's name, amen. Unless I see. Are you a person who has to see to believe? Do you remember the song that we just sang, the second one? I believe, I believe. Are those just words that we sang or words that we would sing? But in reality, do the words believe apply? We don't trust what we've been told, what we're being told. <clears throat> That's not always a bad plan, but if you apply that to everything, then you don't believe in anything. It's interesting. Uh, pulled up some comments from a LifeWay 2022 uh, survey. 53% um, of Americans believe the Bible is not true. That's over half. 60% religious belief is an option. It's a personal opinion. You choose. The majority do not understand why Jesus' resurrection even matters. That's a little, that's the world we live in. And granted, in the Midwest, we may not be on the same path, path or at the same point on the path as they are on, say, the East or West Coast, but this is America as we see it today. We don't trust the one telling us, okay? That, again, can be good or bad. But if you are reading uh, the Bible, or if you're in the middle of a study, do you not trust what is being discussed? What are we being told is not possible? There's a lot of people that talk about the resurrection. That can't happen. Nobody comes back from death. Death is final. If death is final, why are we here? We have no hope. There is nothing beyond our world. Do we only believe what we understand? Or only believe what we choose? It's about me, what I choose. Some interesting things to think about and ponder. In Jesus, what is lost is not only restored, but exponentially renewed. It's increasingly rapid, more and more. It, it rolls. We don't always see that, but in, if Jesus is involved, that's really what's going on. Do we have to see it to believe it? Jesus brings us into the very source and fountain of all blessings, his own life and the love shared by the Father, and the Son, and the Spirit. Do you believe that the Father, Son, and Spirit are one? Do you believe that they love you and want you to be a part of who they are? When we go through a crisis, we usually want to go back to the way things were. An example that I want to use from the Old Testament was the Israelites, as they were leaving, went through the Red Sea, dry land. But what followed shortly after that 
oh, we had all the food, the leeks and the onions in our life in Egypt. Yeah, it wasn't the best environment, but we, we understood it. It was normal. This was home. They wanted to go back to the way things were, not trusting that what was in front of them was going to be far better, exponentially better. We can get caught up in the same thing. Life is what it is today, and that's what we have. Do we look forward to what God has planned for us, for you? We seek reorientation in Jesus Christ. He leads us to a new orientation. When that new orientation, it may not be exactly the way things are right now. And that's probably a good thing. Because if Jesus is running and moving us in a new orientation, it's better. It's good news. It's positive news. From today's text in John 20, verses 19 through 31, verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked, the doors were locked. This group of men were in a home, and they had locked doors where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. What did they fear? What were they afraid of? They just watched their teacher, their rabbi, be killed. Did that mean that the Jews, the leaders of the Jews, was going to come after them? They, you know, they were for fear of the Jews. So in all likelihood, that is exactly why they were gathered together in a locked room. Continuing, Jesus came and stood among them. Doors are locked. What would that be like? Just think about that. You're, at, you're in a, a home with some friends. The doors are locked and Jesus steps into the room. Would you unlock the door and run screaming out for fear? In this world, in this society, we don't see those kind of events happening. Does that mean that they can't or they won't? I don't know. <clears throat> but what words did Jesus say? Peace be with you. There's a lot that's wrapped up in that phrase. We can identify with the disciples locking the doors because of their fear of the Jews. We get that. I mean, if you're in a, in a part of the world or in a situation where you want to be safe, locked door, group of friends, yes, you're going you're gonna to go there. When we go through disorienting events in our lives, we can be fearful of the future. And every one of us has gone through some really struggles at different times in our life. Maybe you can immediately think of a situation. Maybe there's one today that is there. And we don't know what the future holds. The future is scary because it's unknown. We lock ourselves away, grieving the loss of the past. Oh, let's just go back home. It's normal. But instead, we hide out. We don't want to be vulnerable. Jesus gets behind our locked doors, and we all have them. We have safe places that, that we have, and everything's walled off around that. He doesn't wait for an invitation, and he is not hindered by our fears. So, that safe place that you've created in your mind of a locked place, Jesus, is, he's right there with you. He's wanting to help you get out of that fear, that safe place that you've created. Jesus shows up with the words, peace be with you. I want to focus on that for just a little bit. There's some statements that I would like to read. Jesus came to to his frightened friends and said, peace be with you. What does peace 
in this situation mean to you? Is it, you know, the old world peace? Is it peace in your home, in your nation? What does peace be with you mean? This is what Jesus came in and said to those disciples. He didn't say it once. It was multiple times. And each time, the message is the same. Peace. God's peace might offer calm from anxiety. And yes, God's peace does ultimately maybe get expressed in an absence of conflict. But at its root, at its core, this word shalom, as it is uh, in the original, is the defining characteristic of God's kingdom. It marks the presence of God's power, of God's spirit. It's God's rule and reign wrapped up in one word. Picture Jesus telling you, peace be with you. Continuing, I come with this new peace we've been waiting for. I come and I'm ushering in my kingdom in this shalom. And so because of that, everything has changed. The peace of my kingdom has become even more real now through my resurrection. Sin is defeated. He is restored in a human, fully glorified body. Peace is with you because I am peace. What often really connects with people on a deeper level is when they see the healing that has come in my life, that Jesus has brought in areas of woundedness. If you've gone through a dark period, a time that you have struggled with, and Jesus has shown up in the middle of that and helped you through that time, that's peace. He doesn't leave us in our locked room. He doesn't leave us on our own. As he came into that locked room to the disciples, peace be with you. Jesus is the peace, and he's with us, each one. Do you trust Jesus? How many in here have seen Jesus? Yeah. Does that mean that you physically saw him walk into the room in and, and his glorified body? No. But we've seen Jesus in the form of peace in our lives. After he said this in verse 20, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Can you imagine the roller coaster of emotion that they would have gone on over this uh, week's time from one week earlier, Palm Sunday, the joy and shouting, and then the ending of that week in his death, and then Sunday, his resurrection, and he comes into the room with them that evening, locked door, and says, peace be with you. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you have forgiven anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus used his own scars and wounds to serve as a connecting point for the disciples. It would have been one that everybody in that room would have understood because they saw. So if they saw, they believed. But if they didn't see, we will hear of one that didn't believe. A possible fear the disciples had were being caught by the Romans and being crucified like Jesus was. By Jesus showing his scars, he was sending a message. Rome has no lasting power. Rome effectively put him to death, but he didn't stay dead. So Rome's power was very limited. Jesus says to them again, peace be with you. He wanted that message to resonate in their world. Multiple times, I am peace. I am here with you. As the Father sent me, so as I am sending you. And with that statement, Jesus is commissioning the church. 
We are sent people. But we're not sent out alone or abandoned. You know, it's not go and we'll see you when you make it back. No. We're not sent out on our own power, cleverness, or ability. I'm not sure I'd get out outside the door, let alone go beyond. Then he breathes on them and receive the Holy Spirit. Being sent doesn't mean away from Jesus. When he says, I'm sending you, it's not away from him, but sent with Jesus into a continuing ministry. So everywhere you're sent, Jesus is right there with you. There's not a time that you're out there by yourself. We need not fear we are not left alone. We have been given the Holy Spirit and it powers us, empowers us to move forward. Jesus is not giving us the power to make people forgiven or not forgiven, but rather he is teaching us the importance of living in the Spirit. As we forgive others, we come to understanding more fully the truth and reality of forgiveness found in Jesus. That's, that's where we come in. That's a part that we play. Can we forgive others? Are there some people in your life that you just say, not that one. No, I, I can forgive just about everybody, but not that one. Why? Jesus called us to forgive others. But God, Jesus, not that one. I, that, that one, I, I, I got too much hurt. I got too much pain. It doesn't give us that that caveat there. We are asked to forgive others. Jesus did what for you and is still doing what for you? Verse 24, Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. We've all been in a situation where we weren't with the majority of people when some great news was given, and we weren't there to hear it. And it was too good to be true, so you said, I, I'm not sure. The other disciples in verse 25 told him, we've seen the Lord. Can you imagine Thomas's reaction? Really? I mean, you guys are all on board with this, but I don't know. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hands into his side, I won't believe. In essence, he's saying, unless I see, I physically have to see before I will believe this. You know, he's been labeled doubting, which is a very broken way to look at him. Think about this. Thomas was a person who asked the tough question, who made the tough. It wasn't a popular statement, but he didn't stop. He went ahead and expressed, guys, I don't get this. I have to see. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house, effectively representing today. We're a week removed from the first visit. And Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, they were still locked. They, that week didn't change their fear. So they're back in a locked room. Jesus entered and stood among them. You suppose it was just as surprising that time as it was a week earlier? Had they, had they adjusted the fact that Jesus could come and go at any point? But he entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Do you get it? Are you listening? I'm here. I am peace. I am with you. Repeatedly, that is the message. Then he said to Thomas, find this interesting. He wasn't physically in the presence of Thomas when Thomas told him, I got to see, and this is what I have to see. But Jesus immediately turns to Thomas. Put your finger here. What, what was it that Thomas said he needed to believe? Only if I can. Look at my hands. Put your hands in my side. No more disbelief. Believe. How do you think Thomas felt? Everything that he had said, 
Jesus was responding to in a loving manner. It wasn't, hey, you wanted to see? Here it is. In a loving manner, he's letting Thomas see. Thomas responded to Jesus with probably the most profound and accurate statement we can find. My Lord and my God. That, I mean, he boiled it down to the very essence of God. My Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you've seen me? Do we do certain things because we see? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. We've been on both sides of that, I'm quite sure. I know I have. A week later, the disciples, including Thomas, gathered together in that same room behind a locked door. Have you ever not trusted Jesus? I want you to think about that. Think about how that applied to Thomas. Trust takes time and fear impedes our process. Often we react by locking the door and refusing to let Jesus in. And he gives us that, that free moral agency to say, stop. But he also is right there at the moment's notice that you say, I need some help. I need you. Jesus is not stopped by a locked door. And you can think of that in any situation you find yourself. Jesus is right there. He appears behind our locked doors of unbelief. He meets us where we are. And there's a number of you here today, and we're all over the place. Some are going, I get it. I love the peace of Jesus in my life. And others are going, I want to believe. I want to understand. I, I, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm trusting God. I'm trusting Jesus. And he meets us right where we are. Jesus responds to Thomas by inviting Thomas to touch the scars. And his reply again is, my Lord and my God. Jesus restored his faith by meeting Thomas right where he was in his unbelief. And he does that for us as well. There are times we, we can't quite believe what we're reading or what we're told or what we're actually seeing. But Jesus is right there saying, I'm with you. I will help. In verse 29, Jesus asks, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What is it that we are to believe? Can you answer that question? Jesus is risen. This message is what the disciples preached. We are to share this message also. If asked, can you, will you answer that Jesus is? is risen, and because of that, he is on God's throne, fully human, fully man. I believe that. Can I show you visually? No, it's in faith. Jesus is not done getting behind our locked doors and bringing us into his peace. As long as you live, Jesus will be working with you in locked, behind your locked doors. We struggle with that. We're human. The enemy loves it when we lock ourselves away. In a relationship, that locked door is let down. Sharing who you are, where you are, is a form of worship, is allowing Jesus to use you within and around other people. You know, I, I still, and you've heard me say it, but I can still remember the faces on those kids at Bible Club when I made the statement, he is risen, he's on God's throne, but he's coming back. 
and the look on their face was just profound. And that is true. He is coming back. Jesus worked many miracles for his disciples, and not all of them were written in this book. I'd like to see the other book. I mean, not because I don't believe them, but man, can you imagine what that book would be like, listing the miracles upon miracles upon miracles? And the few that we have in the Bible are so wonderful, from healing to providing answers for protection, just doesn't end. And yet, there's a whole other version out there that has listings, possibly. I don't have to read them to believe them. That's the, the key. But these are written so that you will put your faith in Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God. If you have faith in him, you will have true life. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? There's a number of lyrics that go on. This is a great song to go on YouTube and pull up. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord, and listen to the whole thing? Because when we look out and we see the sun sets and the sun rises and we live in a part of the country and the world that we clearly can see some gorgeous, none of them are alike. When you see a mother or a father holding a newborn baby, and then is there a presence of Jesus in that? I think so. I believe he is right there. When you attend a funeral, and you know that this person, you believe, let's put it that way, you believe this person is with God. Scripture says their spirit does go back to God. You see Jesus in that moment. You look at the, the family members and the friends that are in the audience, some very stoic, others, their eyes are sweating like crazy. It just pours out. Is Jesus in that moment? He is helping that person through grief, through his love. And that's a place that a locked door really can become tough. But it's not for Jesus because he loves. So when we see these events around us, have you seen Jesus, my Lord? Every one of us has, whether we recognized it or not. He is involved and he loves each one of you intimately. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to be the best because he comes and says, peace be with you. As we live, may we see the risen Lord who gets behind our locked doors. He meets us where we are, even in the middle of our fear and pain. Some in here have dealt with a tremendous amount of pain. May our faith grow as he encounters us. If you have time this week, take those three that are there. May we see the risen Lord who gets behind our locked doors. He meets us where we are, even in the middle of our fear and pain. And may our, our faith grow as he encounters us. Take some time this week and maybe pray these three things as it applies to you, not anyone else, you. Make this time with Jesus personal. The peace be with you. Let it flow.
let that locked door be unlocked and the door removed. You would join me in prayer. Loving Father, oh God, how awesome is Jesus and the Holy Spirit in you and peace be with us. Thank you for working in our lives, for helping each one of us. Strengthen us as we reach out. Give us the words to say as we are sent, not from Jesus, but with him. God, thank you for our lives. And we openly admit they're not perfect. We struggle with locked doors. We struggle with believing without having to see. God, take each one of us and hold us as we wrestle and as we go through these things that you would pull us through, that you would come in those locked rooms, locked doors in our lives and open the door. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.